Okay, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It is the 21st of March of 2024, and I'm ECM, as always. Welcome to Resistance Live. We have a mountain of things to talk about today in the context of legal developments, not the least of which is Lev Parnas's testimony yesterday on the Hill. It was happening while we were broadcasting live yesterday, and there have been so many more bombshells that have emerged since. We got a lot to talk about there. We got to talk about Alvin Bragg. We have to talk about Judge Cannon. We have like so much to talk about today. But I want to welcome you all. Hello, Germany. Hello, Australia. Hello, Laguna Beach. Hello, Toronto, Canada. We got all our international followers in the house today. Nice to see you. All right. Um, Not that Laguna is international. They're right down the road for me. But welcome, as always. I'm coming to you, as always, from occupied Tongva territory, speaking of Southern California. And today, for our visually challenged viewers, I am wearing a black turtleneck. I have my big, thick hoops in. My hair is down and a little curly today. I'm sitting in front of my plant and my standing lamp and my big cushy chair and my bookshelf here in my office. And I am a pink-skinned, green-eyed, dirty, blonde-haired woman. Thank you all for being here. All right. Um, Lev Parnas testified yesterday on the Hill, and as I mentioned, this was ongoing while we were live yesterday, and there were already some very big bombshells coming out of it, Um, but truly, it was an astonishing day on the Hill yesterday, not the least of which because of who was implicated, and I know that Lev Parnas has appeared previously on Michael Cohen's podcast, Mea Culpa, and we know that he has also cooperated with the investigations um, that were underway with regard to Trump's first impeachment the corruption allegations with regard to Ukraine and what Trump was trying to accomplish there. And we also know that he has cooperated with law enforcement authorities. Um, I know there are some people in the following today who are saying they haven't seen this covered by mainstream media, but I've seen it everywhere. So (laughs) I'm not sure where that's coming from. Uh, It was on every major broadcast last night on MSNBC. It was on CNN. And it was discussed at length yesterday on threads by a lot of different people who were following along with what was happening. So I just want to make it really clear what has been alleged here, because essentially what Lev Parna strung together was that all the allegations about Hunter Biden and the Biden family and potential corruption in Ukraine have actually been a Kremlin based disinformation op. And even more scandalous than that is that there are people on the Hill and the former attorney general of the United States of America, Bill Barr, who apparently knew that this was happening all along, as did Donald Trump. Rudy Giuliani is deeply implicated in this. The Congress people and senators who were implicated in this are Ron Johnson, Pete Sessions, Lindsey Graham, and the former representative, Devin Nunes, who is now the head of Truth Social. Um, all of this is... Um, is deeply, deeply troubling, not the least of which because of something that we discussed yesterday that was just revealed while we were on the air, which is that apparently this mechanism of false and fraudulent information coming into the United States through Lev Parnas and Rudy Giuliani was then fronted to reporters at Fox News, where it went on the air on Fox News into that little disinformation bubble and out to the American public. When you think about the way in which disinformation is supposed to work, and you know, I have to remind everybody that it's not like any of this has stopped since 2016. If anything, it's become more advanced and more nefarious. But when you think about the way disinformation is supposed to work, it is essentially, when, especially when it's coming from a foreign influence campaign, it's supposed to be seeded into existing information structures so that it then becomes more believable to the general public. And so in essence, one of the things that is so troubling about what we learned from Lev Parnas yesterday is that this this faulty and fraudulent, these lies, this disinformation about Hunter Biden's relationships in Ukraine and, and the idea that Joe Bar- Biden somehow benefited off of all of this made its way into what are arguably at least we're arguably, I think at the time, kind of, maybe not to most of us, but made it in some sense into the the mainstream news media here in the United States almost instantly as soon as it landed. And I know how we all feel about Fox. And we, you know, I mentioned yesterday, Dominion voting systems was almost a billion dollar settlement, right? We had, we had, um, We have an ongoing case by Smartmatic. We've got other defamation lawsuits against Fox that could potentially destroy it. But to hear it laid out in this way as perhaps 
one of the most effective disinformation campaigns in history to benefit Donald Trump um, is truly galling. And, you know, I just want to say to everybody who's sort of been thinking about these issues and um, and trying to figure out how to combat them, I do want to mention that we do have this upcoming media literacy program that starts April 15th, where we're going to touch upon this kind of stuff. Like, how can you figure out what's disinformation in real time? When should you be suspicious of what you're hearing and whether or not it's legitimate? So if you want to join us for that, it's GaiaLeadershipProject.com slash truth dash or dash fiction. Class starts on April 15th. And we've had a really tremendous response to this because it's also about media literacy and identifying bots and trolls and all that other sort of good stuff. But we're going to touch upon these issues because it's very difficult if it is being seeded into existing information networks inside the United States to avoid it, right? Or to even know what's legitimate. And if you're not doing the work of building your own media literacy filter on this stuff, it's very easy to fall prey to it. Okay. So the, the next question that I keep getting about this is why isn't anybody investigating? Okay. So I have to point something out to everyone here because again, we have a lot of new followers. We've got a thousand people on the broadcast today already. Please hit the thumbs up and the subscribe button here on YouTube. I, you know, one of the things I want people to be aware of is that there, there are like thousands of investigations going on every day by the DOJ and the FBI of which we know nothing. And that is the way it's supposed to be. The DOJ and the FBI are not supposed to comment on ongoing investigations. And in fact, you will find very often that when asked questions about whether or not something's being investigated, they say they're not allowed to comment. And the only time that we ever learn about it is when somebody's actually been indicted. All right. This happens all the time, especially with regard to information warfare, because most of the time the FBI and the DOJ don't want the people who are targets of the investigation to know what's coming. All right. So it is quite possible, quite possible that there are. In fact, I think we have very good indications, given Lev Parnas's cooperation, that there are ongoing investigations into the people on the Hill who may be corrupt. The real question here is about strategically what is going to be done in the context of prosecution, let alone indictment? Because we know that grand juries get sat all the time and grand jury proceedings, even the existence of grand juries are among the most tightly held information inside the U.S. judicial system. Grand, grand jury proceedings are by definition secret. All right. So there is no way at this point for us to know what is happening inside any of those investigations. But I will just tell you that if I were Lindsey Graham, Pete Sessions, Ron Johnson this morning, I would be deeply concerned about what's underway. Because if Lev Parnas is willing to testify about this publicly, having been implicated, having been arrested by Bill Barr's DOJ and prosecuted for this, along with Igor Fruman, I personally would be very concerned. I would imagine that, you know, the cooperation of a witness like this, who, by the way, was photographed with Rudy Giuliani, knows about all sorts of communications between Russian oligarchs and Rudy Giuliani and the Trump campaign. I would be very, very worried about it. All right. So one of the things that I just want people to be thoughtful about here is that um, one of the things that social media has done to us in this era it is, is that it has made us expect that we are entitled to real time information about what's happening in criminal investigations. And often the absence of information in the public do domain makes us think that nothing is going on. Quite to the contrary, the DOJ and the FBI do 99% of their work in secret. And so I don't want anybody to be under any impression here that nothing is going on behind the scenes. Because I personally do not doubt, again, this is speculation on my part, I don't have any inside information, even though I have friends who work in the DOJ. I don't have any inside information, I wanna make it really clear. But I have no doubt, okay, if Lev Parnas has been cooperating with the federal authorities, that they're not just randomly interviewing him for no reason. All right. So again, I want people to be very thoughtful about the fact, and I always have to remind everybody of this here, and, and this is just for our new subscribers as well, that it took 10 years, 10 years to prosecute everyone involved in the Watergate scandal. And that was a relatively minor scandal, shocking to say, but a relatively minor scandal compared to all of the criminal activity of the Trump administration, the Trump campaign, the Trump organization, and all of its lackeys. So remember, okay, that these things are not instantaneous and that sometimes prioritization has to take a role in how prosecutorial decisions are made. I personally would much rather have a special counsel right now focused on indicting Donald Trump or rather prosecuting Donald Trump in advance of the November election than indicting Ron Johnson, right? I think that that can come 
after the fact later on. And it's really critically important that it does. All right. Um, we have other breaking news developments this morning out of the um, the election interference case that is scheduled now to start, arguably, roughly, around April 15th in New York City. Um, this morning, Alvin Bragg filed hit, that's the district attorney for Manhattan, by the way, I got to remind everybody, this is a local prosecution, not in federal court. That means there's no pardon power that applies to it. And there's no influence by the federal government, even if Trump is reelected, which is not going to happen over this particular prosecution. All right. Alvin Bragg this morning filed his opposition to Trump's demand to delay the state based election interference case involving Stormy Daniels and a Playboy Playmate originating back to 2016. All right. Um, I've read the brief. And I want to I want to clarify some things here about what actually happened, because it's very clear based on the filing of Alvin Bragg's brief now that this was an engineered delay by Trump's defense lawyers. All right. It is not a legitimate delay. And also, it appears that the Southern District of New York may not have actually done anything wrong. You know, there was a lot of kerfuffle about this last week when they asked for not a 90 day delay and Alvin Bragg agreed to 30 and then a 30 day delay was granted on March 13th, which takes us to April 15th. By the way, there's a hearing on Monday on March 25th to determine whether or not any further delay is going to be forthcoming, which is why this is being briefed. So here's what Alvin Bragg's brief says. And I want everybody to be really, really clear on this because the facts really matter here, okay? Alvin Bragg's team asked for documents from the Southern District of New York a while back, like last year in 2023, okay? And they got certain documents that they requested from the Southern District of New York. Back in January, Trump's defense team issued a subpoena to the Southern District of New York for slightly different categories of documents, okay? The two, there was not a, a total overlap in what Alvin Bragg had previously asked for and what Donald Trump's team subpoenaed, all right? That resulted in the Southern District of New York responding to that subpoena, which ordinarily would have a 30-day turnaround time. So that would have brought us to February, roughly, February 15th, for which they got an extension, all right? That they turned around these documents in response to that subpoena. Turns out, uh, in this swath of documents that was turned over, Alvin Bragg's team has now identified only, only 270 relevant documents to the case. And the vast majority of those documents, based on what Alvin Bragg has said in this brief, are what is described as inculpatory. For those of you who don't know, you may be very familiar with the term exculpatory, which would mean something that would tend to prove Donald Trump's innocence, right? It would exculpate him from criminal liability. It's a great word, right? Inculpatory is the opposite. It means that the vast majority of these 270 relevant documents prove Donald Trump's guilt. And on top of it, many of them simply confirm evidence that was already in the hands of the defense. All right. So what this means in the context of this brief, as is being argued by Alvin Bragg, is that, first of all, the Southern District apparently didn't do anything wrong. Second of all, Alvin Bragg's office didn't do anything wrong. Third of all, these documents actually, for the most part, confirm Donald Trump's guilt. And lastly, only 270 out of tens of thousands of documents are even relevant to the case. And then like, Fifth, if you need another reason, they're duplicative, okay? So the whole argument here is that, um, okay, I'm just going to block this person because the thing that we don't do here on this broadcast is claim that there is no justice. Bye. All right. So one of the things that I want people to understand here about all of this is that um, that there is, there is a very strong basis asserted in Alvin Bragg's brief for no further delay. Because in essence, there's no there there. And if there is any like arguable need for a delay, the end result is that it was engineered by Donald Trump's team. Now, I have to point something out here for, you know, for, for, the, re for the folks who are like, why is there always a delay? All right. There is a legitimate reason. And, you know, this is stated in Alvin Bragg's brief this morning quite articulately. 
There is a legitimate reason when new evidence arises from an unknown source. And Alvin Bragg's brief point, Alvin Bragg's brief points this out. And this has been my experience also. In the 15 years that I was a litigating trial lawyer in federal court, this happened all the time. There would be there would be new evidence that would suddenly arrive from an unknown source or a different source or a source that you thought didn't have anything. And the end result of that would always be like a minor delay because everybody deserves enough time to process that evidence to determine how they're going to use it at trial. All right. So Alvin Bragg didn't do anything wrong here in attempting to seek a very short delay for the review of these documents. But I'm going to tell you, this brief that was filed this morning makes an incredibly compelling case that there should be no further delay um, because there was no wrongdoing. There was actually no discovery violations, which is what was alleged by Trump's team. They alleged that, that Alvin Bragg's office had done something wrong by not turning over the information when Alvin Bragg's office didn't even have it. Okay, so it's not a classic situation where there's been some form of prosecutorial misconduct or whether there's some faulty means by which someone has not responded effectively. That's not what happened here. What happened was that Trump's team didn't even issue a subpoena until January 14th. And that response date would have been February 14th. The SDNY needed a little bit more time. And now here we are with a very, very brief delay. So my bet is that we're going to have a hearing on this on Monday and Judge Juan Mershon, who is already like, tough as nails on Donald Trump's defense attorneys in previous hearings is going to say, you're done. We're going to trial on April 15th. Show up and be ready to do your opening argument. And that honestly is how it should be. All right. The other thing I'm going to remind people of here is that if we rush through events like this in a court of law, that is a basis to reverse a verdict. All right. So if, for instance, Judge Juan Mershon had not granted this 30 day delay from March 13th, which I'm going to remind you all is only a 20 day delay from the original trial date, of, which was supposed to be Monday. It's only a 20 day delay. It's not even three weeks. All right. Um, if he had gone ahead and been like, sorry, no delay based on new evidence that might have been uncovered. The end result of that is that we could have had a verdict against Donald Trump, a guilty verdict that would then be overturned on appeal. So again, one of the things that we've really got to be mindful about here is that sometimes minor delays are needed to protect it, an upcoming guilty verdict. And I said this yesterday, and I'm going to say it again. It's really critically important that people understand that a part of what is happening here is the protection of the eventual conviction of Donald Trump. All right. So again, this is not something that some people should be agitated about. And the brief itself, you can go find it. It's posted everywhere. I reposted it on my threads. Go read it. You know, some of it may sound like legalese gobbledygook to you. But honestly, if you look at the facts that are laid out in the brief, and this is one of the great things about these documents being circulated widely all over social media right now, you'll have no doubt about what's actually going on. OK, and that will help you when people come up to you and are like, delay, delay, delay. Trump's going to get away with it forever. You will actually be able to counteract that disinformation because that's what it is with facts. All right. Um, OK, let's talk for a second about what's going on in Judge Cannon's <laughs> Judge Cannon's chambers. Because holy cow. All right. So David Latt, um, who many of you may know, was the founder of the original legal breaking news blog. It was something called Above the Law. Okay. This is also where Ellie Mistal started his career. Okay. Above the Law used to be an online legal blog that was full of gossip and news about the law and mostly big law law firms. In fact, when I was practicing in big law at my old Wall Street law firm uh, down on Maiden Lane in lower Manhattan, a few blocks away from Wall Street itself, um, I used to check, I used to read above the law all the time because they would always have these secret breaking news alerts about the bonus structures that were happening in major law firms. And one of the things that used to happen in Manhattan and big law practice was that if one law firm set a really high bonus, you knew that everybody had to follow suit because otherwise people would like jump. So at the end of the year, we would all read above the law. And David Latt was the founder of above the law. David Latt has now jumped to Substack and he's writing um, now regular pieces on uh, really interesting, breaking legal news around, well, all sorts of things, but also around the Trump investigation. So lo and behold, this morning, there's a breaking news piece from David Latt about the fact that two of Judge Cannon's law clerks have quit in the last year. All right. Um, I have to explain something to people about law clerks. All right. So clerkships in judges' chambers are incredibly prestigious jobs. They usually last from one year to two years, and they are not like secretarial, the way that you would think about a clerk. These are actually highly trained 
very successfully educated lawyers, like you have to be like top 10 to 20% of your class to even be considered for any of this, um, who have opted into essentially supporting a judge in writing their judicial opinions and researching the law for a year or two, which then often leads to incredibly high paying jobs in big law firms. Okay. So these are not jobs that people quit. Because when you quit a clerkship, you're in essence cutting off your ability to then be successful down the road at some of the best law firms in the country. Um, I will tell you, it's 30 years ago this August since I started law school. I started in 1994. And I have never, never in 30 years of, you know, like, being in law school and being a licensed practitioner, heard of any law clerk quitting, let alone two in a single year. Okay. So this in and of itself raises some very suspicious things because if two law clerks have quit judge Cannon's courtroom in the space of a year, something is very, very wrong inside that chambers. Now there is some additional news this morning that one of these law clerks, clerks may have quit because she had a baby. Mm. I'm just going to say one thing about this, okay? If you get pregnant in the middle of your judicial clerkship, you take maternity leave and you come back. You don't actually like quit altogether because again, you're essentially cutting off your career. Like it's over. You're going to be completely out of the pipeline to get into one of these high paying jobs, okay? Then there's a second law clerk that quit in December, and no one really knows what the story is about that. But according to David, David Latt, there's a lot of buzz in that particular law clerk's graduating legal class about what is going on inside Judge Cannon's courtroom. So there's more to be addressed here um, in this regard. All right. But um, one of the things that I want people to be aware of is just exactly how rare this is. And for the person asking if they're usually headhunted, no, this is this. It even gets worse than this because the way that this normally works is that if you have a clerkship, you then go through the whole summer associate process at a big law law firm. All right. So the way that this works is that like sometimes in your first year of law school, but usually in your second year of law school, the fall of the second year, there's a huge rec recruiting process on law school campuses, particularly law school campuses that are in like the top 25. I went to GW. The time I went there, I think it was like number 10 in the country. All right. And the process of legal recruitment on campus in the fall is like terrifying. All right. Because essentially you're put through this incredibly rigorous vetting process where you opt into certain firms that you would be willing to work for. They sign up to interview you and it's a run. It's like a gauntlet. You do like 10 interviews in a day. Okay. Over the, uh, like, and it lasts like a week of like all, it's like crazy. All right. It's like incredibly stressful. And the, the end result of this is that you then get a position inside, if you're in like, you know, again, we're talking like top 25% of the class, maybe less, you get, you then get a position as a summer associate at one of these top 20 law firms in the country. All right. Then, um, one of the things that happens thereafter, and I, I had a, like an unusual route for this because I clerked at a really big law firm my first year of law school. And then I went, went to work for the equal employment opportunity commission on a federal um, summer associate position inside the EEOC because I was really interested in employment law and discrimination. I did that my second year, which is another option. All right. But the way this works for most people who are law clerks is then they get a job offer. They go to the, do their summer associate position inside a big law firm. And then if they get a clerkship, okay, they delay employment at that big law law firm for a year, but it is conditional, conditional on completion of the clerkship. So if you leave your law clerk clerkship, you're kind of like done. You probably will lose your job at the big law firm that you've already been contracted with to get to go to afterwards. So it again, I just I'm saying all of this because I want people to understand like how serious this is. Like you do not quit a judicial clerkship. I have a lot of friends from law school who went the judicial clerkship route. My best friend clerked for a, a, a judge on the DC district court where judge Chuckin is right now. Okay. Another friend of mine from those days in DC is now a federal judge on the district court for the district of Columbia because he clerked first for a judge on that court. Okay. So there's like a whole round of, um, okay. Bye. There's a whole round of means by which a judicial clerkship can lead to a future career in the law. So um, one of the things that I want people to just grasp is like the totality of how serious this is. Now, the real question is why? And I'm going to tell you all with everything else that we have discussed 
Um, back in yesterday's broadcast and earlier broadcast this week about what's happening in Judge Cannon's courtroom and what's happening in these bizarre opinions. Like, you know, I mean, I, I talked about this to, on Tuesday. What this tells me is that the clerks have most likely been, and this is speculation on my part, I want to make it really clear, but like this is what I would suspect, have been pushed to write opinions that are not in line with the law. And that in and of itself raises ethical complications for the clerk itself and himself or herself or themselves in terms of um, their bar licenses, right? It raises serious, serious ethical considerations in the context of upholding um, the things that the, you have to swear to. You swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States when you're sworn into the bar and when you take a position in federal court, right? It raises all sorts of considerations here. And, you know, I do agree with some people who are saying that, you know, do you want to have Judge Cannon on your resume? Well, you kind of can't avoid it. If you clerk for Judge Cannon for half a year already, like, it's going to be on your resume. It's not like you're going to be able to pretend it didn't happen. Okay. But I do want people to be really clear on this, that, um, that there's going to be more breaking news about this. And this is an indication to me that like another indication of, of many now that judge Cannon is really completely off the rails. So again, you can go back and watch the broadcast from earlier in this week about mandamus and how it works and how Jack Smith could potentially get judge Cannon removed from the case. But um, this is this is a very serious bit of breaking news this morning that everyone should be aware of. All right. Um, we have. I know everybody comes on here wanting me to talk them off a ledge most days. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you a couple of really bits of good news this morning to hang your hat on. For those of you who are out there, and all of you should be doing mobilization and organization work to get out the vote, I want, I want you to take these two, more, these two talking points I'm about to give you and use them, all right? First and foremost, we had an announcement yesterday from the Biden administration on tailpipe emissions and, and electric vehicles. Now, Trump loses his mind on this, like loses his mind on this stuff routinely on the campaign trail. All right. And there are lots of people who are like, you know, EVs and gas and fossil fuels. And, you know, like Donald Trump is stealing jobs and all this or a Donald or rather Joe Biden is stealing jobs. All of this is nonsense. But for those who are on the environmental activism bent, this is what Biden announced yesterday are the most restrictive tailpipe emissions policies ever ever. It is very pro-environmental policymaking. And it's a very big deal. You can go read about it. It was like broke in the New York Times and the Washington Post yesterday. Go read the articles about it. All right. Because um, I, I want everybody to understand. I know that there are some complaints among Gen Z that like prior environmental policy has not gone far enough. Biden is hearing that. Okay. And he is moving in the right direction in very positive ways. The second bit of breaking news this morning, which is huge, like I don't, I, I, I was thinking about people I know who are going to have, who are going to benefit from this. And like, it's life altering. Joe Biden announced this morning, another $6 billion in student loan forgiveness, this time for public servants, firefighters, teachers, people who are serving in other ways, like as public defenders, those loans are gone. And to me, this is yet another very extraordinary bit of action by the Biden administration, notwithstanding that the initial student loan forgiveness uh, provisions were overturned by the Supreme Court. The Biden administration is operating within existing Department of Education guidelines to forgive all this student debt. It's huge, huge. And everybody should know about it. I mean, it's a real benefit to people, to working people, working class people doing public service whose lives are going to be completely altered by this loan forgiveness. Okay. I'm seeing 1,610 people on this broadcast yet. If you have not yet hit the thumbs up on this broadcast, could you do that for me? Could you hit subscribe here on YouTube and drop me a comment? That helps me with this channel and it helps to get the circulation of all this really important information out there. Okay. This morning on the Patreon feed, we had a couple of questions that have come up consistently. By the way, if you are not yet a paid subscriber over at patreon.com slash resistance live, you can subscribe for as little as $2 a month and ask me questions for two hours in advance of every broadcast. You also get to join Sunday Coffee Hour, which is super fun, community of progressive activists, organizers, and general people who uh, get together. We get together on Sunday morning. We talk about all sorts of stuff. Um, one of the things that I want people to be aware of is that like, it's these paid subscriptions that help to pay my team who are responsible for all the back-end technical specs here. So if what I'm doing here is a benefit to you, please consider joining us over there on the Patreon feed. All right. Questions from the Patreon feed this morning on two repetitive issues. And I know we have so many new followers here, so I'm going to answer them again. Those who've been here for the last seven years, just bear with me. Um, 
there is an ongoing question that comes up, and I don't know why people are so fixated on this, um, because to me, this is a no-brainer, but maybe it's because people don't understand how the Bureau of Prisons works. The ongoing question that I get over and over and over again is, what happens to Trump's Secret Service protection in prison? Okay, so let me just state this, like, for the record, all right? We have never been in a situation before where we've had a former president incarcerated. And how this would be handled on a logistical stand from a logistical standpoint is kind of anybody's guess, all right? But I'm going to remind you all that the Bureau of Prisons has all sorts of ways of dealing with high profile prisoners. Um, there are particular facilities that can be used. There are particular particular protective mechanisms that can be used, like not putting people in gen pop, meaning the general population of a prison. There are all sorts of means by which like famous people who have done time, really rich people who have done time, like Bernie Madoff or Jared Kushner's dad have been handled inside the Bureau of Prisons. All right. There is actually a prison facility that has come to be known as Club Fed, which is where a lot of high profile, allegedly nonviolent prisoners have been housed and where they do their time in protected facilities away from like ordinarily very violent or mentally ill prisoners. Okay. What I am certain of is that the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, will find a way to deal with the Secret Service issue. And this is not something that I think people should be worried about, right? Donald Trump is not going to be kept out of prison because he's entitled to Secret Service protection. If anything, the Secret Service will be stationed outside of his jail cell, okay? And anything that he does will have a Secret Service agent walking alongside him. All right. But there's not going to be any. And that's even if they decide it's necessary, because given that the BOP already has facilities for handling this stuff, the Secret Service may just simply decide that they're not of use in that environment. All right. So I personally am not at this point worried about this. And I and I and I have questions as to why people actually are. Right. Because to me, this is just not um, at this point anything that anybody should be wasting their time thinking about. The Bureau of Prisons will handle it. And um, how the Secret Service addresses this will also be handled, okay? And I am not, um, the Secret Service is not gonna get in the way of his incarceration for the people who are worried about it, okay? The Secret Service cannot stop his incarceration. If he is ordered to prison by a judge, he goes to prison. Because by the way, a federal judge can order the Secret Service to do things. So. Nobody should be worried about this. Nobody should be worried about this, all right? Um, the other thing that I just wanted to answer that also came up on the Patreon feed today is the question of bankruptcy, which is now coming up. Martha Stewart, yes, Martha Stewart was incarcerated in Club Fed as well. Um, the, one of the things I want people to be aware of with regard to bankruptcy, because there's a lot of questions about this at, at this moment, um, and I, I want people to be very, very... Um, very, very aware of how bankruptcy works, all right? Yes, Trump is out of cash. We did a whole broadcast earlier this week about how Trump is effectively broke, all right? And we now know that he's put not only his family trust, but also his son on the hook for the E. Jean Carroll bond, all right? He's put up his entire Schwab uh, brokerage account as collateral, and he has nothing left, okay? Um, one of the things that people have been raising is what happens if Trump declares bankruptcy. So I want everybody again to rest assured of this, all right? You cannot discharge judgments against you for what are called intentional torts in bankruptcy. Intentional tor torts are essentially intentional civil violations of law that harm someone else. That is a tort, okay? We're not talking Linzer tort like the kind that you eat. It's a T-O-R-T, -T, tort. And your first year of law school, you have a class called torts. It is about like personal injury and, wait for it, defamation and, wait for it, fraud, okay? There is no way that the judgments against Donald Trump for defaming E. Jean Carroll or for fraud against the state of New York can be discharged in personal bankruptcy. It's not going to happen. Okay. This is one of the reasons why I have been saying for like months now, really since last summer when the first indictment dropped, but certainly since the beginning of the New York civil fraud case last fall that the vice has really tightened around Donald Trump now. He is out of options. Okay. He is out of cash. 
He is out of funding. He is out of a decent legal team because he doesn't pay his legal bills. He's coming to the end of the time when he's not going to be criminally convicted and incarcerated. Okay. And I know there are people here like, you know, running through the comments saying, you don't think he's ever going to go to prison. I got news for you. All right. The judges in New York state, particularly this judge, Juan Mershon, has no time for this nonsense. And Trump is alleged to have committed 34 class E felonies in the case that is about to go to trial in New York City. 34. Okay. This case in and of itself could result in him dying in prison. And that's leaving aside the time, the time that he might have to do based on the, the January 6th prosecution. If something happens and judge Cannon gets removed in the Southern district of Florida in the classified documents prosecution, and that's leaving aside Fulton County. So people need to get very, very clear on what is going on. Okay. I, you know, I, I actually really have to kind of like address some of these comments today. This idea, somebody is in the comments saying, pretty sure Trump will not go to a prison camp. Well, we don't really have prison camps. Does everybody understand that? In Alabama, there is still essentially like slave labor where prisoners are forced to work like in chain gangs. That has been brought back. There are very serious racist implications for that in our criminal justice system. But he's going to do time in like a New York state penitentiary if he is convicted in New York City, those are not pleasant places at all, at all. Like, I'm just going to say this, like, I kind of, I, 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 I have moments where I'm like, when people are like, that's not enough time. I'm like, dude, you have not set foot in a prison because doing time in a New York state prison, by the way, if you have questions about New York state prisons, you should go research what has been happening on Rikers Island, how prisoners are dying on ma on mass there because of malfeasance by like the New York Prison Bureau. I have very strong feelings about this, but I'm just going to tell you all that like this is not going to end well for Donald Trump, all right? And I don't think that any any judge who if he is found guilty let alone guilty of 34 felonies at once, is going to say, oh, no, you're off the hook. You just get to sit in Mar-a-Lago by the pool with an ankle bracelet on. That is not going to happen, all right? And I just have to tell you, if you have questions about this, you should go look at the language that Judge Mershon used the last time Donald Trump was in his courtroom. He is not, he has no time for nonsense. And he is not treating Donald Trump any differently than any other prisoner or a potential in prisoner who is who has been alleged to have committed a whole bucket full of felonies before his court. All right. So people very clearly need to just like understand how our judicial system works and who these judges are in front of. And I know there's been a lot of disappointment and I know a lot of people are mad that things haven't happened on a timetable that you all or some of you think should arbitrarily take place. I'm going to tell you, this is all moving much faster than it would be honestly for any other defendant. So, you know, in this manner, right, you've got to actually have a moment of realizing the facts of what Donald Trump is facing down because it is extremely serious. Okay. One of the reasons why he is decompensating so much in public while all, why all of the crazy is on the surface, why he can't string a sentence together, why his mental decline is so rapidly apparent right now and why he is losing his mind on truth social routinely posting like 40 things a night when the platform is up and running about like witnesses in his criminal cases. It's because he knows that the end is coming and it, like it might be here by as soon as June. Okay. So, um, so I want everybody to be really wise about this. And when you are tempted to fall prey to cynicism and bitterness and, you know, these faulty beliefs that there's no way he's ever going to go to jail. That's why I'm here. You should be here listening to what I have to say, because my 15 years of experience litigating in federal court is not for nothing. I did a lot of white collar crime cases. They weren't criminal prosecutions, but they were civil cases that had a criminal component. That's basically what I did for the last like mm, nine years that I was practicing law. So I have a very deep understanding about how all this works. And I also taught law at Columbia Law School. So like, you know, you want to know how this all works so that you can assure yourself of what's actually going down and what you need to worry about and what you don't. You should be here five days a week with me. And I'll answer your questions, by the way, if you happen to be a patreon.com slash resistance live subscriber. Cause you can ask me questions for, for two hours before every broadcast and I will answer them live on the air. Okay. Final thoughts for today. 
I got to remind you all that we are moving now into like heavy voter mobilization season. Okay. It's the end of March. We are now like April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. We're now like eight months, seven months, really, from the presidential election. And a lot of the work that is being done by organizations now to start getting out the vote is really going to start ramping up come May. All right. This is your moment. We have so many new subscribers and followers here this week. This is your moment to volunteer with an organization to help get out the vote. This is an all hands on deck moment. And I know you all have watched you know, MSNBC recently, you've seen people like Timothy Snyder talking about the importance of combating fascism in this election. Liz Cheney, for God's sake, was out yesterday saying she's going to vote for Joe Biden because it's an all hands on deck moment to save democracy. OK, we all got to get the vote. And that means that this year it is not enough to just vote. You've got to get out there and volunteer to actually do voter mobilization work where you live. So please, I mean, I, I just want to ask all of our brand new followers here for whom we are so grateful. If you live abroad and you are an American citizen, get involved in Democrats abroad. Okay. If you live inside the United States, get involved in your local Democratic Party, your local indivisible chapter, your local red, wine, and blue. Sign up to do work with Moms Demand. Get to work if you're Gen Z or you have family members in Gen Z. You just have kids who are the, in that age group. I do. Um, to, to get involved with organizations like uh, Voters of Tomorrow or Leaders We Deserve. That's David Hogg's organization. There's so many ways to get involved here. And you can canvas. You can phone bank. You can text bank. Go to Working Families. You can go to mobilize.us. And you will see all sorts of opportunities to volunteer. But we desperately need everybody to get involved. And I'm just going to say one thing. I have a broadcast from earlier this week, the one about Trump being broke, that now has had 30,000 views. Okay? 30,000 people change elections. Right? 30,000 people in swing states guarantee that Joe Biden is reelected and that we take back the House and we grow our lead in the Senate. So to me, this is a ripple effect to what we do here. And you have an obligation as an individual to get involved. It is participatory democracy. It doesn't work if you don't work it. All right? So that is my thought for today. If you have not yet liked this broadcast or subscribed here on YouTube, please make sure you do that because it helps this channel and it helps to support all the good work that we do here. And, you know, if you want to become a subscriber over at Patreon, I would love to see you. It helps to pay my team behind the scenes. Think of it like an NPR or a PBS subscription. If it serves you, please support it because um, it takes a lot of work to do this broadcast five days a week, six days a week if you're a subscriber. And we would love to have you on board. It's a great community of people over there. So awesome. Like really, really good people. All right, my friends, lots of love to all of you. Thanks for watching today. I'll be back tomorrow at regular time, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, and uh, back with breaking news in between if there's a necessity for it. All right. Have a great rest of your Thursday, everyone, and I'll see you here tomorrow. Bye.